talk to you about using AI for predicting atrial fibrillation after uh, pulmonary vein isolation. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Ayşe Emre from Siyah Mersi Heart Center, Istanbul. And I would like to surprise you with uh, an interesting beginning. When I was a boy, world was better spot. What was so was so. What was not was not. Now I am a man. World have changed a lot. Something's nearly so. Others nearly not. There are times I almost think I am not sure of what I absolutely know. Very often find confusion and conclusion I concluded long ago. In my head are many facts that as a student I have studied to produce. In my head are many facts of which I wish I was more certain. I was sure. Is a puzzlement. And I'm going to discuss whether AI-generated algorithms will put an end to uh, Mr. Yul Brynner's puzzlement. Let's begin with uh, a systematic review of today's, today's present prognostic models for predicting recurrent atrial fibrillation after ablation. Uh, in, uh, uh, in this systemic review, which uh, explained uh, all studies, all uh, models, like more than 30 studies and 13 models, including Apple, Atlas, Ambulator, etc. Uh, the model prediction based on C statistic uh, was found to be uh, just around 60% in most cases, as you can see in the figure. C statistics for development studies are higher than validation studies. This also raises questions as for uh, general of the data uh, among other patients. Again, one may notice the confidence intervals around C statistics to be wide. And uh, in seven of them, in seven cases, in studies, uh, confidence intervals are even not reported. In the same review, uh, after comparing multiple scores in the same population, Still, predictive, uh, no predictive uh, model consistently showed better discrimination based on the C statistic. PVI, our main topic today, is known for good results in paroxysmal trigger dependent AFib and uh, modest results in persistent AFib. Uh, non pulmonary vein triggers and substrate and comorbidities like uh, obstructive sleep apnea, especially in persistent AFib. Uh, are a problem uh, in PVI. Uh, Ernest PVI trial investigated non-inferiority of a PVI alone strategy in patients with persistence AFib. And finally, finally, this year in uh, the Congress of European Society of Cardiology, uh, stop AF first trial recommended the first line cryobalone ablation in patients with paroxysmal AFib. So, AF, uh, PVI is a cornerstone uh, in uh, uh, management of uh, atrial fibrillation of all kinds, paroxysmal, persistent, long-standing. But our main topic today is to relate how uh, is how to relate AI, uh, especially algorithms, uh, for predicting. Uh, recurrences uh, after the procedure. The first uh, article I found when I started to search the topic was this one from Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, titled Novel Approach to Predict uh, AFib Recurrence After Pulmonary Vein Isolation Using Simulations of Patient-Specific MRI Models and Machine Learning Dated uh, January 2020. Uh, their uh, background was, uh, hypothesis was, uh, was 
24% uh, uh, of patients develop recurrent AFib following first ablation procedure and need a repeat procedure. So uh, if we develop a novel approach to predict uh, AFib recurrence after TVI, this would uh, provide an individualized patient-specific model of the patient's atria using MRI. And then we'll, uh, based on this uh, model, we'll uh, make stimulations to find out the types of arrhythmia that, that might occur. Uh, all these results will be fed into a machine learning algorithm and the features extracted will help us predict what will happen post-TVI. Uh, the terms uh, I'm using, like machine learning and uh, 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 and deep learning and uh, algorithms, I'll discuss uh, about them. Uh, don't worry. The the second uh, the second study that I uh, came across. Actually, the second and the third ones were from Stanford University. Uh, it was a case series uh, which used support vector machine. Again, uh, bear those terms in mind. I'll discuss them in a minute. Uh, support vector machine is a, a part of a machine learning algorithm. They trained their input from cardiac CT and clinical features and had a predictive accuracy of 80% for success of atrial fibrillation ablation. Uh, just remember the 60% in the recent review uh, published in Europace uh, in uh, just a couple of months ago. So it's a big difference, it's a huge difference. In another study, uh, a convolutional neural networks, again, uh, bear with me. Uh, this is a uh, part of a deep learning algorithm. Uh, in patients with successful ablation, convolutional neural networks found out that the features for ablation targets uh, that were gathered via uh, the algorithm had a 95% accuracy. So uh, no more worrying about uh, which patients uh, to perform PVI and uh, which, will, uh, which patients will uh, gain the most from the procedure. And then uh, as I go on, as I continued on my research, I uh, came to this compendium on atrial fibrillation, which uh, uh, that was titled, how will machine learning inform the clinical care of atrial fibrillation. Uh, this was actually a challenging topic for me because the uh, all this literature was uh, published in like uh, the health, uh, like the late uh, 2019 and uh, 2020. I mean, only two years of uh, articles published. Uh, so I have to uh, check every day uh, whether something new happens uh, or uh, added uh, to uh, this subject. Uh, now I have to uh, get you acquainted with the basics of AI. Uh, what we call sample size in traditional statistics is the training data set in AI. Algorithms created on these uh, training data sets are then uh, transferred to a tested on a new data set, and they are called the testing data set or validation data set. Learning curves, uh, area under the curve, are important for the choice of a machine learning algorithm. Overfitting, which we'll hear a lot, uh, is uh, today a problem, maybe a problem, for uh, algorithms. Uh, too many variables included in the training data set may not be valid for the tape testing the other set, but there are solutions to overcome this problem also. So we kept saying machine learning, machine learning. Machine learning is, uh, has uh, three forms. Uh, I'm going to discuss two of them. Supervised learning. Supervised learning uh, is uh, just data labeled by humans are used to create algorithms. The, the five steps are you train a machine for 
like x many potential variables and then uh, the weighted variables from the training data set form the algorithms prediction model is formed algorithms are applied to the de testing data set the new data set and the prediction model uh, to calculate risk is generated it's 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 the most uh, simplest version to explain the concept uh, there are many kinds of algorithms used in supervised learning, like uh, the previously I mentioned support vector machine. Uh, that one and random forests and decision trees are the most commonly used ones uh, today, maybe tomorrow uh, or in the, in the future, uh, other methods will be produced. Uh, supervised learning can predict categories, values, unusual patterns, but selecting the right algorithm is very, very important, depending on data characteristics, learning curves, number of parameters. There are limitations to supervised learning. Uh, small training data sets can cause inaccuracies uh, and bias, and this may mislead the learning algorithm. Thus, uh, we need large training data sets usually, and uh, supervision is done by us, by humans, So, uh, and we are subjective beings, so uh, labeling training data sets may uh, cause, uh, again, uh, some bias uh, in, the prediction pro in the prediction process. Artificial neural networks work like work like brain neurons used for image processing uh, to evaluate nonlinear relations, have a higher predictive accuracy than linear or logistic regression, and can be used by deep learning algorithms. Again, uh, data overfitting is an issue here, and uh, it takes long computation time, and uh, you need uh, graphics processing units for uh, these. SMM, uh, is less prone to overfitting and requires less memory than uh, neural networks. There is, I, I've mentioned the three most common ones, SFM, SVM, sorry, decision tree algorithm and random forest. Decision tree algorithm may be applied to small data sets. It includes a series of yes-no yes, questions used in prediction and uh, preferred in simple tasks. Random forest is uh, like decision tree, but decision trees here are combined and each are trained independently. It's similar. With unsupervised learning comes unlabeled data. Uh, therefore, the algorithm finds out the patterns in the data set, hidden in the data set without human intervention. Uh, two methods, clustering or association rule learning algorithms, uh, mostly cluster algorithms are used. Uh, so uh, this is how it goes. Uh, when no obvious groups exist, data similar to uh, one are separated and dissimilar to other clusters are put aside. Uh, so uh, you find a hidden pattern. Like uh, in daily life, uh, I. Uh, put an example there, what you see on your co computer screen when you search for something on uh, Google or anything, you know, uh, you find uh, the results matching your own online lifestyle. This is cluster uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, it also has its limitations for now. It might be hard to identify the initial cluster pattern. Uh, uh, so inaccurate decisions may, may occur and uh, you have to test uh, again and again on different cohorts. And there is the deep learning. Deep learning is where neural networks come. It just works like human brain, layers of artificial neur neural layers. A network generates automated predictions from uh, training data sets in, uh, input. It's mostly used in image recognition, especially applied, maybe applied to noise data like in uh, strain imaging or 3D STE. Uh, it gives better spatial and temporal resolution, so it's a promising uh, 
teacher and unsupervised tra training for unsupervised learning can be performed like for example uh, investigate uh, when investigating drug interactions neural networks uh, uh, an author called it a black box i completely agree with that because uh, we hardly know what goes in them but the simplest again the uh, easiest way to understand how they work is uh, goes like this the first layer has nodes that that pass input to following hidden layers the nodes in the hidden layers get input from several nodes potentially all nodes in the previous layer how each node weights its inputs is adjusted during uh, various trainings and the final output layer makes the prediction uh, again uh, overfitting uh, this overfitting is uh, comes up a lot uh, when uh, talking about algorithms but uh, here we have a solution if the training set gives better prediction with each step and the validation set is not improving that's where overfitting starts so uh, you have to stop there or uh, this means that this model is only good for the training set but uh, is not guaranteed to work on a separate data set uh, i'll just mention uh, convolutional neural networks cnn which is a variation of deep neural network uh, as i've said it's mostly used to recognize visual patterns directly from pixel images uh, uh, and uh, mostly used in deep learning studies in cardiovascular medicine or cardiovascular pre precision medicine and in electrophysiology a uh, recurrent neural network uh, i have to mention that also because it adds to cnn because it uh, also analyzes uh, it, it, uh, much more uh, context uh, like the past the older information uh, in addition to hidden patterns uh, it analyzes time series both forward and backward so imaging data ekg data invasive electroanatomic mapping data clinical factors clinical bio biomarkers all can be used as input and trained and uh, used for decision making and prediction so in the second half of my uh, presentation i'll uh, mention four studies which i found uh, to be related and good examples of uh, uh, the title of the uh, presentation the first one is machine learning and mechanistic simulations uh, the, the first one is titled machine learning and mechanistic simulations uh, predicts likelihood of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation recurrence following pulmonary vein isolation it's a single center retrospective study includes 32 patients with paroxysmal AFib who and underwent PVI uh, these patients had uh, their MRI and then a personalized computational model of left atrium uh, is constructed and then uh, AFib is simulated via rapid pacing and all three features are fed into the uh, machine learning classifier trained optimized validated 10 times and then a prediction value uh, is attained this is the flowchart of the study uh, the computational model the uh, fibrotic atri atrial sites uh, the uh, MRI images, uh, the uh, simulations of AF induction, all put as uh, inputs into machine learning, and then uh, receiver operating curve uh, is produced uh, for AFib recurrence risk production. And uh, here is a detailed uh, uh, figure showing. Uh, mechanistic modeling results of a induction uh, in uh, certain patients left atrial models uh, maybe uh, uh, the participants may uh, examine those later on i'll just pass it uh, 
in this figure, I would like you to focus on uh, figure B, actually. Uh, this is a prediction of AFib recurrence post-TVI using machine learning features, combining uh, raw MRI uh, data with simulations of AF, AF, AFib induction. So, uh, uh, figure B, look at the area under curve values, 0 0.82, 0 0.47, 0 0.81, uh, and we'll discuss them now. The machine learning uh, algorithm predicted probability follow, uh, of AF recurrence following PVI with a validation sensitivity of uh, 82%, specificity of 89%, and the validation area under the curve of 0.82%. Again, this is a very high score. Uh, the uh, yellow line. Uh, when only features from simulations of AFib inductions were used, we uh, uh, also got a similar result uh, under curve 0.81. Uh, but when only features from uh, raw images, raw MRI images were used, the, the validation area under the curve significantly decreased to 0.47. So, uh, this uh, emphasizes the uh, combined version or uh, the importance of simulations of a FIP induction on the reconstruct model, not just the raw images. Uh, this is again uh, analysis of inductive features because it's the topic is uh, mostly uh, concerns. The, the topic mostly concerns electrophysiologists, so I uh, try to put some uh, colorful uh, figures uh, for them to uh, examine. Uh, here I would like to emphasize that the frequency with which uh, simulated uh, atrial fibrillations uh, are performed. Uh, the, the most predictive inductive uh, feature is reentrant driver and macro reentrant tachycardia uh, in uh, left uh, inferior pulmonary vein look at figure a and mid anterior wall this is why i put uh, this figure so uh, machine learning based uh, atrial fibrillation recurrence risk prediction methodology incorporated uh, both inductive and deductive that sorry i forgot to mention that inductive means is self-learned deductive means uh, you put the uh, input uh, pr prior to training uh, so uh, just to make it simple uh, raw mri data uh, simulated AFib and you have a predictive accuracy of 0.82. If you only do simulated AFib, uh, then you have a uh, area under the curve 0.81. Uh, that is what you uh, might remember. <laughs> this study. The third one, the, uh, the second study uh, was the automated extraction of late left atrial volumes from two-dimensional computer tomography images using a deep learning technique. Uh, LA features, left atrial features, are important predictors for uh, AFib recurrence after catheter ab ablation. Deep learning techniques are used for uh, left atrial detection and segmentation in pulmonary vein computed tomography images. Following segment, segmentation of the uh, left atrium in each study slice, the 3 the LA geometry was, can, could, can be automatically reconstructed. Uh, the, the deep learning model, this deep learning model uh, created by the authors, uh, provides a quick and effective way to automatically create the 3D LA geometry and quantify the left atrial volume, which 
we can use easily in clinical practice. The left atrial volume, volume measured by the deep learning model uh, predicts AFib recurrence after ablation uh, uh, with uh, a predictive accuracy of a significant value for one year. I'll show the figures uh, next. And uh, especially the cutoff point of uh, 139, 139 milliliters is an independent predictor for the one year if uh, recurrence. This is a flowchart for building 3D geometry of left atrium, uh, usually presented in these uh, 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 cardiovascular studies involving AI and algorithms. You'll see these figures. Uh, the rock curves of uh, receiver operating curves of left atrial volume and a left atrial diameter are presented here. Uh, the blue line is left atrial volume. So uh, you see it has the highest predictive value of uh, 0.74 uh, at one year. At two years, it's still significant, 0 0.06. And uh, 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 figure B uh, demonstrates the importance of the cutoff value of uh, 139 milliliters. Uh, the Kaplan Meier analysis uh, search uh, analysis provides us with the uh, follow up data in both groups. Uh, the low rank p value is significant. The uh, third study that I'm going to mention is uh, titled Predictors of Atrial Fibrillation Early Recurrence following cryoballoon ablation of pulmonary veins using machine learning algorithms. Uh, this study incorporated uh, both paroxysmal and permanent AFib patients uh, who were uh, enrolled for their first pulmonary vein isolation. Uh, there are some uh, definitions, I'll pass them. Uh, two algorithms were used for predicting the probability of ARAF, uh, support vector machines, I've mentioned them, uh, decision trees, again, I've mentioned them as basic AI uh, terminology. The superior uh, support vector machine algorithm um, uh, is used to uh, differentiate the two patient groups while the uh, boosted trees algorithm uh, helps uh, which uh, feature will go, will branch to the right group, will belong to the right group. And uh, after final uh, classification, uh, I think there were 56 variables integrated into the model. Uh, seven variables showed up to be significantly uh, uh, predictive of the uh, AFib recurrence. Uh, and machine learning algorithms confirmed these findings. What were these uh, uh, predictors? Uh, easily the biomarkers of uh, myocardial injuries such as troponin elevation and uh, uh, creatine kinase MB fraction. So, uh, a greater uh, biomarker release uh, meant uh, a better outcome uh, due to a more complete procedure. Uh, this was confirmed by machine learning algorithms. The last study I'm going to uh, mention is uh, a validation of a known uh, score uh, by a machine learning algorithm. The KEP AF score, I don't know how the electrophysiologists uh, pronounce it, uh, but uh, it stands for uh, certain risk factors and used to predict long-term freedom from AFib after ablation. The, by the way, the score is uh, obtained from a single center. 
This study examined the predictive performance of this score for its repro uh, reproducibility and created subgroups. This score is from 0 to 30. So it's a bit hard to uh, identify which is which. So uh, by machine learning algorithm, uh, the authors tried to create simpler groups, propose simpler groups to best predict AFib recurrence uh, using the CART model. Uh, this is again uh, a machine learning uh, uh, algorithm and they found out that uh, you can easily group the patients into low, intermediate and high risk patients. Uh, zero to five, uh, the scores, uh, patients with scores uh, from zero to five are low risk patients, uh, six to eight intermediates, nine to 12 high risk patients. And as you see from the table, the intermediate group ha is uh, like 2.5 times um, <clears throat> at more risk for uh, uh, recurrence of atrial fibrillation. And the high risk group is like uh, six per, uh, six ti 5.6 times more at, at uh, 5.6 uh, times more risk than the low risk group. And the uh, uh, this uh, uh, study uh, created by the machine learning technique uh, provided us uh, a simpler uh, way uh, to keep in our minds and uh, uh, that uh, we can easily practice in our daily routine. And uh, this is uh, all I'm going to say about uh, using AI. Uh, AI is a huge, huge, huge topic. It includes robotics, cognitive science, computer vision, everything else. But uh, regarding uh, cardiovascular medicine, uh, we are more uh, uh, affiliated with algorithms, especially machine learning and deep learning, which is a part of machine learning. Uh, what I have uh, come up with this is uh, people see this as a future. I do not, uh, I think we are uh, all living in a world of algorithms. Uh, in cardiovascular medicine, the first article I read was I think in 2017 uh, in uh, Journal of American Cardiology, and it mentioned uh, artificial intelligence in uh, precision cardiovascular medicine, and nothing uh, about AI was mentioned before. Uh, now in uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, studies are start, starting to come up and uh, presentations in congresses are starting to come up. I, and I think uh, in, the blink, uh, in the blink of an eye, we're going to start uh, using uh, all these uh, methods, the algorithmic methods, and uh, maybe there will be a transition period from C statistics or traditional statistics, but I think this transition will, will be quick. Uh, one uh, uh, thing uh, I uh, want to make sure is how we feed uh, these algorithms, the input. Uh, mostly we are at the level of supervised learning now. Uh, the tech firms are doing the deep learning and uh, neural network things, but in cardiovascular practice, we're in the supervised learning phase now. And uh, how we feed the inputs uh, into this uh, training and validation, what we put in there, how we label uh, the variables is, uh, import is an important issue. So my last slide, uh, I put a scene from uh, Sherlock, uh, BBC production, which I love to watch, 
Um, it's about Sherlock. It's, it's, its title is called Sherlock and the Solar System. I think it summarizes what I've been uh, trying to say uh, in just about two minutes. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, all your uh, attention. Thank you, Dr. Uh, yes, a study in pink. Nice. Well, you know, pink lady, pink case, pink phone. There was another pink. Um, no. Well, I thought you'd be flattered. Flattered. Sherlock sees through everything and everyone in seconds. What's incredible, though, is how spectacularly ignorant he is about some things. Now, hang on a minute. I didn't mean that. In oh, a... you meant spectacularly ignorant in a nice way. Look, it doesn't matter to me who's prime minister or no, no. who's sleeping with who. Or... Whether the earth goes around the sun. Oh, yeah. God, that again. It's not important. Not important. It's primary school stuff. How can you not know that? But if I ever did, I deleted it. Deleted it? <laughs> Listen. This is my hard drive, and it only makes sense to put things in there that are useful, really useful. Ordinary people fill their heads with all kinds of rubbish, and that makes it hard to get at the stuff that matters, do you see? But it's the solar system! Oh, hell, what does that matter? So we go around the sun, and we went around the moon, or round and round the garden like a teddy bear. It wouldn't make any difference. All that matters to me is the work. Without that, my brain rots. Put that in your blog. Or better still, stop inflicting your opinions on the world. So, <laughs> that's all for my uh, speech. Thank you, Dr. Aisha, for your nice presentation. My name is Reza. I'm a medical student in Madison University. I want to ask you a question. The sooner we start using AI algorithms, the better are the traditional methods a part of a pastime paradigm. Thank you. Ah, um, well, I personally think that past is always uh, a paradise, a pastime paradise. I mean, uh, but uh, uh, I think. Uh, Yes, traditional uh, methods, not just about the statistics, uh, the modeling, the, uh, the algorithms. I think all will change in, I, I, I predict, uh, I mean, it's subject, but in a couple of years, maybe two, maybe three years, we are going to see all articles uh, uh, using uh, these uh, methods, these machine learning algorithms, deep learning algorithms, neural networks, training, validation, data sets, uh, instead of C statistics, uh, under the title, under the part uh, statistical analysis. Uh, the algorithms will help us. Maybe uh, it's a bit creepy because uh, the uh, way we practice may change because uh, now we uh, read and uh, do our own statistics and come to a conclusion and then we uh, publish it and then we uh, share these with our patients and uh, together with the patients and the relatives of the patients we come to a decision. But now with this hidden layers, <laughs> uh, uh, Everything will be different. I mean, uh, certainly it will not be replaced by uh, AI, uh, but uh, maybe we sh the sooner we uh, uh, get to live uh, along, uh, get to cooperate, collaborate with AI, uh, the better. Uh, the, um, the, our work will change, that's for sure. Our uh, medical education will also change, uh, not only uh, in an engineer, uh, like there is the traditional medicine, there is the medical engineering part, biomedical, and uh, this, this is completely a separate world. I mean, um, 
and it's not the future it's uh, it's right now i think but um uh it's uh, used to separate us ourselves from the past and um uh, maybe from now on uh, we'll um, uh, study traditional medicine uh, but uh, we have to be uh, well equipped with uh, knowledge in uh, data analytics data analytics in algorithms uh, that's I, I mean um, that's all I can say about it. Uh, the, 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 the tradition is uh, will be will all be uh, will always be there, uh, but uh, the newcomers should be aware that another era is opening. I think. Thank you so much, Doctor, for your answering. Hello, Doctor Aisha. I have one question. Mm -hmm. Issues to be settled by collaborating AI into our practice. Uh, uh, yes, uh, my actually uh, my last slide uh, uh, is uh, a summary of that. But yes, certainly. Uh, that is you have to uh, give uh, lots of data to uh, train uh, to validate these algorithms and data privacy is an issue uh, especially in medicine medicine is not just like com computers i mean you have to explain certain things to, to your patient how you come with that decision you have to explain uh, and get his or her consent. So um, uh, this, I think, uh, will be uh, uh, data privacy uh, is uh, one of my concerns. And um, there is also, uh, what else? Uh, there is still the bias uh, issue in algorithms, especially in supervised learning. How you, uh, which features you extract and put uh, as uh, input. Uh, that's the bias issue. Um, that's the, there is the liability issue because uh, the. Uh, the machine uh, learning algorithm will tell you to do something which may not uh, be the same as your uh, practice. Uh, so uh, who is going to be uh, responsible for the decision? Uh, the machine, uh, the, the one who created the algorithm, you, uh, this might be a sort of a problem, the liability risk. And, uh, I think the curriculums will change uh, in medical faculties uh, with this uh, uh, AI coming uh, as a uh, new, new uh, and uh, strong uh, uh, you know um, uh, factor in our lives. Um, what else, what else? I, I, I've actually considered the uh, issues of AI, um, uh, how it will have impact on us. There's privacy, liability, uh, change in curriculum, and the black box issue. Uh, especially in deep learning, the hidden layers, how they train themselves, uh, we do not know because uh, there are the weights put on the uh, variable study and how they change uh, in the, uh, during the layers uh, and how the result comes up. 
uh, and why that result uh, comes up. Uh, it's like the black box of a pile. So uh, I think, uh, but these are all uh, 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 factors that can be solved uh, if uh, the uh, Participants in healthcare, the physicians, the, the ministries, the pharmaceutical the industry, uh, all come together and uh, find solutions. We thank you for your kind contribution.